much. Hi, everybody. You enjoying Aspen so far? Having a good day so far? Excellent, excellent. Thank you all for making time for us for a conversation that we think will be edifying and entertaining and, and worth your while. We know that we are just two out of three. We'll do the best we can to fill the gap. And we look forward to conversing with you and hearing from you your thoughts about the intersection of race, the law, and hip hop. I am an old school hip hop head. I grew up with hip hop in the 80s, back in the days of UMTV Raps and Fab Five Freddy. And if you are too young to know what that is, ask your parents, they will tell you all about it. <laughs> And I know from the early days of hip hop that criminal justice in the law has always been a part of the scene, either with the way that artists were treated or what artists were talking about. It was one of the very first things that put hip hop on the map. Almost immediately after hip hop was something fun, you have a hit like The Message by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, and then hip hop could be a reflection of what's happening in communities of color that whites may not know about but are deathly curious to hear in a form that's engaging and meaningful. But then you have these artists who also have to deal with the realities of criminal justice. So you have this weird Mobius strip of reality where there's these artists who are rapping about something real and they are part of the reality that they are rapping about. So what do you do if you're one of these artists who's caught up in this Mobius strip? You need a good lawyer. <laughs> hopefully just one, hopefully you ain't raising that much hell that you need a team. But you need at least one good lawyer. And our guest for this hour gained a reputation as one of the top attorneys representing hip hop artists in the industry, especially in Atlanta, where his firm, The Feindling Group, is based. He has been practicing since 1987 in that group, The Feindling Law Firm, after serving as an assistant public defender in Fulton County, Georgia, which is in the Atlanta area. He is the president-elect of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and we'll be talking to him about that in just a moment. First, please welcome our guest for the hour, Drew Feindling, to the stage. <laughs> welcome. I got a few questions, you got a few questions. My goal is to ask about 15, 20 minutes worth of questions just to get us started. I have learned whenever I moderate these panels that I never have the best questions, you do. So I'm just gonna ask a few to give you time to get your thoughts percolating. We'll have some mics that'll work their way around the room. It is 5.34, I'm gonna try to honor your time and get us out of here on time. I believe we're supposed to finish at 6.30, so that gives me about 56 minutes, but I work in radio, I can do a lot with 56 minutes. <laughs> First of all, Drew, we should address that someone is missing this evening. Offset, I know Offset is not here, what happened? Well, I mean, we knew we were rolling the dice because his wife, Cardi B. Oh. All right, try again. Uh, because his wife, Cardi B, is due next week. Uh, so it's it's just been a you know touch and go thing. I, I was at the baby shower two nights ago, and I was looking around, going, "Man, is he going to actually make it?" And I, I just think too many too many things, too many balls in the air, including a new baby, and uh, he just was not able to make it. So, uh, but I think we'll we'll you and I will will do a great job. And um, but I can't rap, I can't sing, <laughs> I can't finish up. Roses are red and violets are blue, let exactly. alone come up with a 20 minute string of lyrics. So. Exactly. And did somebody say, Joshua King, you're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> this is what your co workers will do to you, people. <laughs> well, we will soldier on without offset. And please extend all our best Absolutely. To him for, the, for the newborn. I get the feeling that this life you're living now, being the, art, the attorney representing hip hop artists and TV stars, feels a little weird. Do you ever look around and ask yourself, how the hell did I get here? Yeah, so I, I, you know, the way that Aspen heard about me is the New York Times ran an article on the billion dollar lawyer, uh, which is a story uh, in and of itself. Um, and all the time, uh, I, I say, I, I have no idea how this happened. That's always the question, is how did it happen? And my answer is, I have no idea. Um, I'm a criminal defense attorney. 95% of what I do has nothing to do with the hip hop industry. Uh, but I started representing folks, and there became a trust and almost like a father-son relationship and a friendship. Uh, one of the first people was Gucci. Everybody know Gucci? Yeah. And, and Gucci, uh, great who, wedding who, by who, the way. Who, who does not know Gucci, honestly? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I you can't, might want to clarify. I, I can't even name a song, okay? Uh, but, but yet, Gucci and I talk all the time. Gucci Mane. Like, Gucci Mane, yeah. Right. Um, look, uh, you know, the thing to me is he's Raydrick to me uh, and all these guys. So when I hear Offset, to me, it's Chiari. And I, I don't call them by that name because my relationship with them is, is different than that. Uh, but Gucci, Raydrick really kicked it off. We became incredibly close. And at the same time, 
a record label took off in Atlanta called Quality Control, which is by far QC, the hottest independent label on the planet Earth. Um, they have now signed uh, Cardi B, they have Migos, they have Lil Yachty, they have Trippy Red, they have Lil Baby. They are smoking on fire. And I know those guys, they're Atlanta guys, and they are one of the greatest stories um, in American business. And so it all just kind of has come to me, and, and it's been an interesting ride. A lot of what we want to discuss with you today has to do with your perspective on criminal justice and the intersection between race and criminal justice through the lens of your clients. I want to get to that in a second, but first I want a clear sense of kind of how you got to this point and how you got to this perspective. You're a defense attorney? Yes. What was it about being a defense attorney as opposed to say a prosecutor or a contract lawyer or a tort lawyer that appealed to you? Well, I. First of all, I love trying cases, and that's what I do for a living. So you'll, you'll learn if anybody is a lawyer or has friends with a lawyer related to a lawyer that 99% of lawyers that say they're trial lawyers can't find the courtroom. Um, I actually get to try cases all the time all over America. So I love that. Um, and I, I am a true believer in our Sixth Amendment. I'm a true believer in, in defending folks and giving them absolutely everything that they're entitled to. And so because I believe so much in the system, I love being part of the system. You said the Gucci Mane was the first hip hop artist you represented? Who was the first? So Gucci would be kind of the first guy. There's been a lot of other people because I go back, does anybody remember BMF, right? Big Meech? Uh, so if you're in Atlanta, my answer would be different because all I have to say is in a certain age group is I was and will always be Big Meech's lawyer. That has a certain meaning, particularly in the black community, that white folks don't understand. And so uh, it's not been uncommon for me to walk through a mall and have people come up to me, believe it or not, because he had a reputation as a little bit of a Robin Hood, and shake my hand and say, wow, cool, you know? And there was a book that came out about it, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of kicked it off. And I did not realize at the time how my name spread. And so then record labels started sending business to me. But the Gucci thing really put me on the map because of my commitment to him. Uh, because Gucci and I went through a lot. He had a few big cases. And it all took off after that, one after the other. Before we get to Gucci, talk a little bit about Big Meech in that first case. I, I understand that there are things about the case you can't discuss for whatever right. reason. But what was that first uh, case like? What did he need from you? What was your strategy like? How did that go? Sure, sure. So, so Meech's ultimate demise was a federal case, a federal drug case. But in, in the community, um, what really was more important is he had been charged with two counts of murder. He had been charged with uh, killing P. Diddy's bodyguard. And he was charged with two counts of murder. And a lot of people in Atlanta knew he was innocent. And we were able to defend him and prevent him from ultimately being prosecuted in that case. And I sincerely had no idea that the street had, my name had taken on a new meaning in the street because of my dedication to that case and my belief in his innocence and ultimately really proving he was innocent. And so that kind of spread and made my name go viral. And I, I sincerely had no idea that was happening because I'm just some lawyer. I don't really have an ear for the street. Um, and so I did not know what was going on. But if you interviewed the people at QC, or if you talked to Gucci, or if you talked to Jeezy, or any of these people, they would say, yeah, Drew, man. We know Drew because he was the BMF guy back in the day. I didn't know that, but it was happening. Was there a process where you had to kind of gain the community's trust so that people would open up to you, so people would talk to you? or? Was that easy once he kind of blessed you as his attorney? No, I think it, 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 th this is what uh, most folks don't, don't, real, don't realize, and that is uh, whether it's in hip hop or whether it's in white collar, one thing that people all have in common, they want a lawyer that cares, a lawyer that's dedicated, and most importantly, a lawyer that wins. Uh, that, is what a, a, that is what a rapper, that is what somebody that has their public defender appointed to, and that is what corporate counsel is looking for in, in a Federal Foreign Corrupt Practice Act case. They all have the same thing in common. They want you to care, they want you to be learned, but they want you to win. And once you won that case, when did you start to realize that you had gained, or begun to gain, kind of a reputation? You know, I don't think there was a moment of realization. I just think the phone started ringing a whole lot. Yeah. What kind of calls were you getting? Well, there was a lot of media interviews uh, and just all different type of cases. Uh, and so we, my, my practice is unique in that I, it, I would define it as diverse. We have as big an international practice as any small firm does. We have a robust white collar practice and 
and we have a whole lot of hip hop stuff going on, but we also do more pro bono than anybody that I know, particularly with uh, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, we, meaning I, am extremely dedicated to a lot of causes that emanate from that, that bar association. Can you clarify a little bit more what it is that you actually do for your clients? I think I want to make sure that we don't get the impression that you are the better call Saul of hip hop. Like, what does your service actually involve? Are you a fixer or are you, like what do you do? Do you have like a vat of lye in the back of the office? You know, what's, what's the job? Uh, first of all, first of all, there's only been two seasons of Better Call Saul. Who's watching it? I mean, are you, aren't you ready for him to become Saul? I'm growing impatient. It's coming. It's, it's, it's coming. It's coming, I know. Yeah. Uh, no, no, we're not at all. And actually, listen, I spend almost every six or seven weeks, I'm out in LA because of the type of clientele that I represent a lot of famous folks. And I'm there with fixers. And fixers are people in generally very big law firms that just help famous people with their problems. We don't. We go to court for you. We file motions. We try cases. Uh, so, you know, I represented anybody know Waka? I mean, I, we, we got a not guilty in front of a jury for, for Waka. Um, we represent, who knows, Cat Williams. I mean, I'm basically his corporate counsel. Um, and, and so we are in court constantly, you know, proving ourselves and our dedication to our clients. So there are fixers. It's a real life concept, but we're not one of them. I noticed when you asked if people here knew who Waka was, Waka Flock of Flame, or if people knew who Cat Williams was, not a lot of hands went up. <laughs> but, but that's okay, because you have described yourself as someone who's not particularly a hip hop fan. Totally not, yep. And not a big listener. Not I imagine all. you probably haven't listened to most of the albums of your clients, maybe a few, but not a big listener otherwise. For people who are here, who might be maybe equally distant from hip hop culture, Talk about what it is that resonated for you when you started to learn about these clients. Like, what's, what's the value of what they do? What's the impact? What's the resonance? Like, what's going on with hip hop that you think makes these people worth giving a proper, robust defense? Well, that's, that's, that's an important question uh, because I think that hip hop and the treatment that it gets, other than the, you know, you, you see some of the, the signings they'll get with, you know, advertisers. Um, a lot of that, of what you see, particularly when things are not going well, is really a, a statement on the way that particularly black young men are treated in, a, in America. Um, a lot of hip hop is in your face, we are young black men. And that makes white folks really uncomfortable. White adult folks, the young kids that all go, go surging to the stage. The first time I went, uh, the first time I went was, uh, you mean to a hip-hop concert? To a hip-hop concert. I, I went after I had represented Offset and got him out after nine months in, in a case, and I had promised a couple people, including him, I'd go see him. And I will tell you, the 85% young white audience threw me off. Um, and when uh, Lil Yachty started singing, who was unknown at the time, when he started singing and I saw all these white kind of fraternity guys like surging out of their seats to the stage, I was like, this is nuts. Um, this is, and no, knew every word to his song. Um, but when things go wrong, when there's a problem, um, then the finger pointing starts. Then it's let's bash the lyrics, and let's bash the clothes, and let's bash the concepts, even though there's not been a musical genre in the history of our nation um, that is making more money. Um, because let me tell you something, when you go to a cool hip hop birthday party in Beverly Hills, like, I've gone to, uh, the white executives can't get there fast enough. Um, so everybody's cashing their checks, except when things go sour. Talk a little bit about, with regards to that perspective and the way people view hip hop culture, prosecutors, particularly in light of the Migos case that you mentioned, mm -hmm. but generally speaking, how do prosecutors treat your clients from your perspective? Does the behavior change at all because they're hip hop artists as opposed to the way they might treat just like some other young black dude off the street? Yeah, so it, it changes often because they hear the lyrics, they see the videos, so they're gonna assume that, uh, that if it's a movie and it's a prop gun, 
it's not a prop gun if it's a video for a hip hop rap star, okay? Even though if you look at these videos, they cost millions and millions of dollars. Um, even though they use stunt people, they're gonna assume that the white powder is actually cocaine, but they're not gonna think that when they, when they watch you know, a, a, a movie like The Godfather, uh, they're gonna, a Scarface, right? They're gonna, because if you had the same thought process, then Al Pacino's face and Scarface went into pure cocaine, and we know it didn't, or he'd be dead. But if it's a rap video, they're going to assume that it's cocaine in the video. They're going to assume it's real guns in the video. And to me, that's just so disingenuous. Walk us through the Migos case. Tell us what happened. Sure, sure. So I guess five years ago, uh, uh, I was out of town, and I got a phone call that, and that was a different part of the Migos uh, uh, trajectory at that point. I guess they were, I'm going to act like I know what I'm talking about. They were famous for Versace. Hmm. Uh, and... Um, and although I will tell you, my wife has tried to drag me into Versace's and say back then, go, you got to tell them, you know the Versace people. Um, and uh, like, no, sweetie, come on, we gotta, <laughs> yeah, let's go. We're not, let's go. We're not going in there. No, 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 we're not no. going in, um, as if I was going to get a discount. Um, <laughs> and so they went and did a uh, a concert at a college called Georgia Southern University, and it was one of the uh, like senior student invites. So they were actually invited by the students. It came out of the students' funds. Students paid for them to come there. And it's in South Georgia. They never should have gone um, because, you know, to get into that courthouse, you literally had to walk past the statue of the Confederate soldier, all right? And there's no doubt there's a lot of white robes circulating around that community. And law enforcement was literally lying in wait for them. So when they got there, um, they no sooner left than they went they went charging into their, their vehicles. Uh, I call them church buses. They went charging in because back then they didn't have the fancy Mercedes Sprinters. And they had security people that had guns. There, was, there were people that were licensed, but they just assumed everybody had them. They found some marijuana, and they just prosecuted everybody. Um, because Kiari Cephas, who was offset, had a criminal record, it took nine months to get him out. Um, one of the, uh, the hearings that stands out uh, is in our third attempt to get him out, we flew an executive from New York, uh, a, a iconic music executive. And uh, while he was there, uh, offsets, lovely mother, um, and her colleagues are here actually, uh, we're colleagues here, was testifying. And the judge, who was Caucasian, stopped her. Literally, ma'am, ma'am, stop for a second. I just want to point out, you are very articulate. And, and so I'm just like, wow, man. This is crazy. And so, the, you know, of course, the judge was at the end, after talking to how articulate was, said, but I'm going to keep you in jail for a little longer. And so they wrote about it, by the way, in the local paper a couple of days later. But they didn't talk about it like the New York Times would, or the Washington Post, or any paper would be, like how disgusting it was. But they made a point of the fact that, wow, even the judge noticed how articulate this woman was. And, and so the, the executive and I are driving away, and he says to me, dude. Did that judge stop the hearing to basically say, hey, check out the black woman. She's articulate. Um, and so that's the environment that he went through. And, and the bar of justice, one side was all white. That was the court personnel, the lawyers, the judge. And the other side was not only us, but everybody in this county in South Georgia that was of color that was being prosecuted. And the statistics are un unbearable. And, and I, should, I should say that that is what prompted me on a personal level um, to start taking trips on, uh, uh, throughout south, the, the southern part of the United States um, in poor jurisdictions, trying to examine the kind of representation um, that poor folks are getting in Mississippi and Alabama and beyond. Because if Migos, even at that stage, with you know, big record labels, making sure they have the best lawyers around, can get treated like that, what are poor folks getting treated like? Before we get to some of your questions, what ultimately worked in your client's favor? The amazing thing was um, we put a ton of work into the case. The original charges against him were all dismissed. The only charge that he entered a plea of guilty to, because there was a video recording of it, as him being tormented by a white inmate and having a fight with that inmate. He had to enter a plea. Um, to that fight, which was all caught on, on video. But the reason he sat in there nine, for nine months, ultimately, which he was innocent of, was all dismissed. So you had to keep him in there 
for nine months, make him lose his mind being caged like an animal to the point where finally some white hilly, hillbilly redneck tormented him enough that he got in a fight with him, for that to be something he had to enter a plea to, to get out of jail, which of course we know is, you know, with anybody concerned about cash bails, is epidemic in our country, where people just enter guilty pleas to get themselves out of jail and then have to deal with the collateral consequences of convictions for the rest of their lives. I want to open it up to some of you. How many of you have got a good question that's kind of percolating that you'd like to put to Drew? All right, before we start moving the mics around, and we'll have, I think, two mics, one there and one there, we'll start moving the mics around for questions. I have one rule whenever I do Q&As with audiences. My one rule is please, please, be generous with our time. There are plenty of people in this room who have a great deal of life experience and insight and expertise to share through their questions, and I'd like for us to gain as much as possible from this time. So the more generous we are with our collective time, the more we can learn from one another. So I would appreciate it if you would please, when you take the mic, introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, and then give us your generously worded question. <laughs> cool? All right, who's got a good question working? While we get the mic to you and to you, one other thing I did want to ask, and I think this comes up a lot with people who aren't steeped in hip hop culture and just don't understand it, who see it from the outside. All your clients know how young black men are treated in the criminal justice system. They must know that the gang culture that they sometimes embody in music puts certain stereotypes on them, and I feel like a lot of people looking at hip-hop culture from the outside cannot understand what would possess a young man who knows all these things to commit any, they shouldn't jaywalk, let alone do anything else. Can you give us a little more context on that? Why would a young man who knows all of this still let himself get in trouble with the criminal justice system? Well, I, I, think, so, I, I think one of the reasons is uh, right now I represent, now no one's going to know, but he's Get, take your pens and write this down. Trippy Red, anybody here of Trippy Red? Okay, this, he just had his 19th birthday last week. I love this kid. This kid, his persona in videos is how he's made himself famous. He is a sweet, brilliant young guy. But he's 19 and has millions of dollars. When I was 19, I don't know about you, <laughs> but if you had given me $500, I would have gotten a boatload of trouble, let alone millions and millions of dollars. They are still kids, and as much as we try to surround them with, with different folks, um, their temptations are just exponentially greater than everybody else. And sometimes I would say that's the issue. The second issue is there's a tendency, and this is my criticism, Joshua, to surround yourself with yes people. Therein lies the problem. You're going to be tempted at 18, 19, 20, 21 years old to mess up, but you need a system of checks and balances. Um, and that system of checks and balances are people to say no. That is the problem with folks. And it, it's not only getting in trouble, but it's wasting money. Um, so you have certain young folks that, to their credit, they handle their money well and they surround themselves with neutral and detached people to tell themselves no. And one of the things that I do, you and I talked about Lil Baby. Um, anybody know Lil Baby? He, he hadn't done one thing wrong. And sadly, he got out of jail 17 months ago, never rapped in his life until he got out. And now he's you know, traveling the world. Uh, this kid is so impressive uh, to me uh, because he comes to my office hasn't done anything wrong just to talk. And I will give him 24-7 attention because I am so impressed. Um, and in fact, I got him, as we talked, a speaking engagement uh, coming up. Uh, so kids like that are, are amazing. And perhaps it's because he's had a touch already of what it's like to be incarcerated. There's an element of the surrogate dad in what you do for some of these clients. Yeah, so you know, I'm, an, I'm an empty nester. And if you look at my social media account, it's my son that does it. I wouldn't even know how to post uh, on, uh, on Instagram, or, I'm sorry, the gram. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, there is, and that, of, of course, uh, my relationship with Offset is, you know, is, is, was featured in the New York Times. It's a big part of a CNN piece coming up. And so, uh, but it, there's so many others that I have that relationship with. And I think it's a good thing. And it's a good thing not only for them individually, because I also do it because I know so many others are looking at them 
So if I could keep them on the straight life, then their influence on others, because you know, you think you think it's hard getting into Harvard or making it in the NBA or making a major league baseball or getting into medical school. <laughs> Try making it in this industry. You know, really, who makes it? Twenty people. I mean, I'm just you know a lawyer in Atlanta, and I got enough beats sent to me. Okay, I don't even know what to do with them because you know, quite honestly, I don't even know what a beat is. But everybody sends me beats because these people are desperate to have their music listened to because the chances of making the industry are like lying on the beach, getting struck by lightning and bitten by a tick all in the same day. Um, it's really tough. Let's get to some of your questions for Drew Feindling. If you would just introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, if you're with an organization, and then what's on your mind. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Olivia Rivers. I'm the deputy director at the Bridge Over Troubled Waters out of Houston. We're a domestic violence and trafficking agency, so we work with crime victims. So my question is, obviously, hip hop culture tells these beautiful stories of a particular subculture of people. Um, but my, I'm curious if the creatives within the hip hop culture feel some sort of responsibility um, when we take responsibility for, I guess, the, the, uh, these collateral consequences that we're discussing when their language and their lifestyle kind of glorify the things that us advocates are trying to eliminate. For example, your client um, recently had to go on social media to apologize for homophobic lyrics right. um, using the word, for example, queer, but saying that he used it not in the connotation that it's known. So do you think the creatives play a role in kind of perpetuating some of these ideas? And how can we stop doing well, that? So is it Olivia? Olivia? Olivia, I'm sorry. Um, so Olivia, by the way, I probably tried more battered women syndrome cases than anybody in America, and that's a true fact. Um, so my roots go way back. Way before I was doing this, I was doing pro bono representation of bottom line women charged with um, killing their boyfriends and husbands. So we'll have to talk at some point about that. Um, look, they're artists, and they're going to make mistakes. It's just their mistakes are magnified. Uh, so uh, I can only tell you that when I'm around them, I don't see anything like that because, the, in fact, their exposure is, is really greater because of the art form, um, the people that they see, um, the, the, the um, socializing and doing business with people of all ethnicities and all uh, sexual orientations. I don't see anybody that I know that in any way um, has any ill will. Does something come out in an off moment and then get magnified because of social media. If any of us in our lives made one boo-boo, and because of that boo-boo, it went to the tens and hundreds of millions of people that because of social media magnifies exponentially what they do, a lot of people would find themselves in similar issues. That being said, I lecture them all the time that they have a responsibility. Um, they have a responsibility on issues of social justice. I have been lecturing them. I am really, as a lot of people are, upset about the Kim Kardashian, Alice Marie Johnson. That's great. She's one person. President Obama, with the assistance of my organization, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, let out almost 2,000 people. And I have talked to many people in the industry and said, you all need to be on your Instagram accounts right now saying, well, thank you, Kim, and thank you, Mr. President, but our last president let out over 2,000 people. Um, and that's the number we're looking for, thousands. That is where I scold them, because they have these tremendous social media outreach, and they need to be taking advantage of it. And I did tell Cardi B the other day that I congratulate her on taking a stance on what's happening at the border. And you know, when you read her social media, you know it's her, because the messages are the way she talks. Right. And I did tell on the phone, good for you. Now get your husband to do the same thing. Is it a little surreal for you to be able to call Cardi B? <laughs> and say you need to be more vocal or to talk to like hip hop artists and scold them in your words about social justice. I don't know many people that many hip hop artists would let scold them on so, anything. So, so, so Joshua, I actually think that's the important part of why I don't go to concerts and why I call them by their regular names because if they don't want to talk to me after that, I can care less. I got plenty of other work to do and things to accomplish in this lease that we call life. Um, so uh, I have, um, no problem doing with that. It doesn't really affect me whatsoever. Um, 
I mean, I think it would be really cool to meet Michael Jordan. Then I'd be, I would never say anything bad to Michael Jordan, because <laughs> he's biblical. <laughs> right, we're not scolding Michael Jordan. Yes, sir, what's on your mind? Hi, uh, Victor Siegel, I live here in Aspen. I'm not a lawyer, um, so this may sound a little inside baseball. I'm a recovering label executive. I used to be at IDJ. But what, and, and this is, it's an optics question, and I'll be curious to get an honest assessment. If you look at a lot of artists, whether it's Joel Katz or Grubman or any of the guys who have last names like me, Siegel, generally speaking, that's the guys who do your music lawyering. When you have a civil case, whether it's you or Yale Gallant or somebody else, it tends to be a white Jewish guy who's, who's defending them. Now, that has nothing to do with your legal abilities. Right. I wonder if that's an optics thing, and I wonder if that's a very specific way of thinking that, God forbid, you get into that issue. So, you know, I agree with that. Um, and so let me tell you what I'm doing about that, because you are right. And, and so all I can tell you is what I'm trying to do, and that is through the greatest bar association that I know in America, mine, National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, I have purposely made it my mission over the past year as president-elect and again to reach out and try to get as, as a diverse membership and as diverse leadership. That needs to be our focus, but the way we do that is to have outreach to young African American lawyers, young Hispanic lawyers, and say, listen, this is a way to make a living, okay? I know it seems cool to do some of the other things, but come over to this side. Don't be scared of being a criminal defense lawyer. We have this amazing job of making sure that the Sixth Amendment survives through this treacherous 18 months we've gone through and the next two and a half years. We need all the help we can get. So I'm with you. And if, and if I can do anything to impact the number of black and brown lawyers in America, I will do it because you're right. Yes, sir. Hey, how's it going? Elias Alcantara from Bronx, New York, birthplace of hip hop. So glad to hear this conversation. And thanks for the shout out on President Obama. I actually worked with him on many of these commutations. Awesome. Uh, my question is, can you just dig a little deeper on this responsibility that hip hop artists have? I mean, we're in a moment in America where, yes, I'm, I, I sit with you in terms of Kim Kardashian not necessarily being the only face of criminal justice reform, but being an important one at the moment. What more can they do? Georgia took major steps, a Republicans, a red state, you're there. What more, I mean, do you feel like these artists, when they, when they interact with the system, they're more prone not to want to necessarily be advocates because they've been affected by it? And how can we make them become the next Meek Mill or TI for that matter that's in Georgia? So, so first of all, um, I, I would be remiss not to shout out the first lawyer that defended hip hop people in trouble was out of the Bronx, a guy named Murray Richmond. I don't know if you ever heard of Murray Richmond. He, he's an icon in older hip hop for being there in the beginning, and bless his heart, he was the first guy. So, so you, can I use you as a segue to Meek Mill? Okay, is that cool? Feel yeah. free. So let's talk about Meek Mill, and if this doesn't answer your question, just punch me in the face later. Um, How about we just give you another chance? Before, <laughs> um, just give it a try. So, so here's the thing about what happened in, in Meek Mill. I, I, I speak at least 24, 25 times a year to lawyers all over uh, America. And um, one of the things that I'll always say is, will we agree that the three biggest problems with our criminal justice system are racism, collateral consequences, and mass incarceration? Everybody raises their hand. And I'll say, great. So we all agree, and all the American Bar Association, NECDL, we all agree and we get cool editorials in the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Tr Chicago Tribune, and we get pieces on 2020, and here's what happens. Nothing. Because we, particularly my age group, right, fail to recognize what we talked about earlier, and that is communication is changed forever. So Meek Mill, he was a rapper in Philadelphia, an icon in Philadelphia. You know, everybody loves him in Philly. He gets, he has a judge that's in love with his case, um, who happens to be an African-American woman, but nevertheless loves keeping and continuing him on, on probation, right, which is an issue of, of collateral consequences, because the consequences of a conviction are you keep somebody on probation, which is really, to me, the modern day shackles. So you're keeping this black young man, okay, with his shackles around his ankle, because he can't screw up over 10 years. Let me tell you something. There's a whole lot of people here that during the la last 10 years probably maybe had that third or fourth drink and drove. 
okay? Um, but if you're Meek Mill, you have a judge that's just in love with extending it. And so then what she decides to do is when he pops a wheelie in New York, which she can't do with his motorcycle or whatever, and gets ticked off at somebody putting a, fa a camera in his face in St. Louis, revokes his probation. And she gives him three to six years, right? So which is part of the mass incarceration because in America that constitutes 5% of the world's population but 20% of the world's incarcerated population. We think nothing of just put him in jail for three to six years. And of course the race issue is the genre of music he is that's dominated by particularly young black men. So for three to six years, and what happens? Instagram goes crazy. Forget about editorials. We now engage people that are 18, 19, 23, 25 years old. They all of a sudden are engaged, not because of an editorial that nobody reads. They're engaged because of the gram. And they literally shut down that city on his behalf and then later with actual help from the local public defender's office and a progressive newly elected district attorney he gets out but i think the responsibility i mean excuse me i think the ones that are truly accountable and deserve the credit are the people that got <laughs> folks stirred up on instagram one of whom was a great american hero colin kaepernick colin kaepernick has such a huge following um, because he's a victimized black man, that his followers went crazy on Instagram coming to the assistance of Meek Mill. It's interesting, before we get to the next question, something about the Meek Mill case. Like, we were in Philly uh, visiting friends around the time that that kind of broke open recently, and everyone was talking about Meek Mill. Our Lyft driver was on fire about Meek Mill. He had legal analysis <laughs> about what happened. And I feel like some of these cases, especially the Meek Mill case, it's almost like it gave people a lens to look through and say, this is what's wrong. And because it was hip hop, everybody knew, at least everybody in Philly knew, probably everybody in the Delaware Valley knew who Meek Mill was. And it, it gave a, an object lesson in exactly what communities of color have been talking about for a long time, but they didn't have a high profile enough example to say, see this thing, this is what we've been trying to tell you. Yeah, no, I, you're, you're right. And, and you know, there have been other issues. I get um, on my Instagram account that my son's run, runs, you know, I get all these help these people and, and I look and I'm like, oh, I don't, you know, this is a guy that shot somebody. He may have, you know, 100,000 followers on Instagram, but like he shot someone in front of 12 people. Uh, I, I don't think we need to be fighting for him as much um, <laughs> as we do that someone gets their probation revoked for three to six years. Um, but you're, you're right, the visceral reaction to it was raw and deserving. Yes. Hello, my name is Jessica Lucas. I have a lobbying and public relations firm in Kansas. One of the challenges we have at the public policy level is law enforcement and the prosecutors who, as we try to advance criminal justice reform policies, are there and it's perceived then by legislators as anti-law enforcement. So through your association, through the work you do, what advice do you have for those of us who are trying to change policies to enact criminal justice reform measures but are bumping up against this perception of being anti-law enforcement because we're trying to make this progress? Well, um, a couple things. One, you're the statewide federal defender, if you haven't met her, she's a friend of mine and she's phenomenal. Um, there's some real heroes there. Uh, uh, you have a juvenile court judge there, Joe Johnson. If you know Joe, you know Joe, right? He's my man. Um, he's amazing. And uh, so there's some heroes there. And I think I want to say Joe was, when he started in criminal defense, one of three African-American lawyers in the state doing criminal defense. So he, there are heroes like that. But here's where you, uh, the, what I really want to get to, and that is Joshua and I talked earlier. Who would have thought? that there is a, a, a coalescing, so to speak, of both sides of the continuum on criminal justice reform. Um, somebody uh, made, ref you made reference to Nathan Deal, who I'm giving a Champion of Justice Award in a program that I'll talk about if you give me a second later um, on collateral consequences and prisoner reentry. A, a Republican governor in Georgia is arguably, arguably the leading governor in the country on criminal justice reform and he is a true Republican but but we are seeing we are seeing our friends at the Koch brothers general counsel Mark Holden who's holding a breakfast roundtable together is one of the fiercest advocates on criminal justice reform um, 
I haven't spent a whole lot of talking to him. I'm so excited about meeting him tomorrow, but I am well read on, on what Mark has written about criminal justice reform, general counsel from the Koch brothers, who believes that the Sixth Amendment is what it's all about. So I think there are allies on both sides of the continuum that know that it's not anti-law enforcement. But you also have to remember that one of the things that we're living in right now, we have a great opening because, not to get political, but we are hearing anti-law enforcement rhetoric coming out of the White House right now about the FBI. And while these have been some of the toughest people for me to examine in many trials in 30 years, I have tremendous respect for so many women and men in the FBI that do not deserve to be taken down um, from the Oval Office. So you'll see you have allies in law enforcement. And of course, we know there's an anti-prosecution sentiment that's coming out of the Oval Office as well right now. So you'll have allies more than you think. Let's get to our next question. While we move the mic over there to you, uh, I just want to make sure, you've referenced the Sixth Amendment twice. Does everybody here know what the Sixth Amendment says? Here's the Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witness against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. That's the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution. It's the basis of all criminal defense in the United States. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is uh, Riva Hines. I'm a professor at Southern University, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, my question is, uh, majority of, if not all, hip hop artists come from marginalized circumstances and marginalized communities. And many are propelled uh, very young from uh, poverty to fame, and zero to 60. Um, so I'm glad that you are representing them. Um, but what do we do to the upstream problem of, uh, and what are your thoughts of having something in place to transition some of these young ones from, uh, you know, going from zero to 60 in such a short period of time and getting famed them and knowing how to handle that. So how do we handle this upstream problem, upstream before it goes downstream to you and gets to be a bigger problem? So I, I actually was in, 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 in court last week talking about this for somebody and I, I said to the judge, I said, I, I liken this to, because you are right, what pe this is such a big money business right now that we're seeing promising artists at 13, 14 years old um, literally going to, coming to Atlanta uh, like we remember in the old days, you know, actors going to Hollywood. And I said to a judge, it's no different than a promising tennis, tennis star going to some academy and missing out on their youth to train. And, and I think with a lot of these artists, they, they, they're missing out on part of their life because the, the journey is so overwhelming and time consuming. And what people don't realize is that the people, the one thing I know about this industry, I don't know anything about beats or any of that other stuff, but here's what I can guarantee you. The people that make it have a tremendous work ethic. They work harder than anybody I know. My, I, I was fortunate to have, my, my daughter was a division one athlete. And, and she had these rules and regulations about two and a half hour practices and all this stuff. Let me tell you about the people that make it as rappers. They are in the studio 18 hours a day. Um, the ones that are in the studio six hours a day, they never make it. And the record labels, if they sense that you're putting in less than a 10 hour day, they're just not gonna fund you. And so kind of the, you know, the answer is that they, they miss out on so much that when it comes to them, they, there's a tendency to be a little crazy. And what you have to hope is that they line themselves up with some really good people. And there are some really good people out there. There are some people, there are some record labels and management people and money management people that are fantastic. It's just a matter of, I try my best to introduce them to those people. That's all I can do, as opposed to what I talked about earlier, the yes people because the yes people are a threat to your existence. Is that part of what helps turn artists around? I mean, we, I, I had the pleasure of interviewing Gucci Mane on 1A last year in September okay. when his autobiography came out. Wonderful interview. 
Great he, guy. Great, great. Deep, thoughtful. He had a real story to tell. Yep. And he told it for us. And I, it's clear from his autobiography and from talking to him that his work ethic was always strong, even when he was running the streets. It was the same work ethic when he was running the streets or when he was in the studio. But at a certain point, in addition to being addicted to lean, this prescription cough medicine drink that is one of the worst things in the world to be addicted to. But it's, a, it's an epidemic. It's an epidemic, for yeah. sure. And he acknowledged that that was basically killing him. Right. It was ruining his body. And he couldn't exert the kind of work ethic he wanted to have in the studio if he was doing all this other foolishness. I wonder if that is what ultimately for the clients that you deal with helps them turn around. This realization like, I can't do the thing I'm trying to do if I let all this other stuff drag me backwards. Yeah, well, and that is what, because well, Gucci's strengths are twofold. One, his work ethic is second to none. And secondly, if you were to talk to the people in the industry, more than his musical talent is he is considered to have an eye for talent second to none. Um, he, I mean, he discovered Migos. I mean, he is, he's discovered numerous people. He has this innate ability to discover talent. And so folks like him, he, he did come to a realization. And uh, I will tell you, when I, I, when I got him out, I got him out early, like six months early, and we had a, it was one of the times I went to a concert at the Fox Theater called Gucci and Friends, and I was with him and his now wife, and before he hit the stage, it was surreal, you could literally hear the crowd calling his name, and it was just, it was just Keisha Kaor, um, who, if anybody doesn't know her, she has 20 times more money than he'll ever have because she is major in the, in the cosmetics industry. He was slurping on, like, you know, Maxwell House in the back, drinking coffee. And I was like, Gucci, which I said, Radrick, if people there that are fighting to stay sober can see you drinking your caribou coffee, right now, it would do a lot for a lot of people. Um, and his sobriety has been a blessing for him. And he did talk about it on the show. That was one of the things that people did comment yeah. on, that he's kind of been very public about trying to turn his life around. Let's see if we can squeeze in a few more questions before our time is up. Yes. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm visiting from Miami. You mentioned the impact that Larry Krasner's election in Philly had on Meek Mills's, uh, the outcome for Meek Mills. And I'm wondering, heading into the midterm elections in November, what campaigns or examples of activism or elections need our attention and our resources in the world of criminal justice reform? So look, I, you know, I'm, my, uh, my staff that works for me right now, if they were here, they'd be pulling on my back of my coat saying, don't talk about politics. Um, and the, the only reason I do is I, I, I have, I do a lot of, of uh, public corruption cases, and I represent, I've been on both sides of the continuum. I, I, while I was representing the most feared right-wing Republican prosecutor in the state of Georgia, literally during that, I was given an award by the NAACP for my representation of a very prominent African-American politician in Atlanta. I don't care who you are. Here's what I care about, the Sixth Amendment of the United States. I care about your right to counsel. I care about your right to a fair trial. And if I sense that anybody is a threat to our system, I'm going to call you out. I don't care if you're the president or you're the dog catcher in the neighborhood. So that's why I comment on it. I don't care about anything else. You know, my, like I said, my lease on life is the, other than my family is this particular issue that I care about. But I think what we can do is we're seeing the catch-all phrase now: progressive prosecutors, and we need to get behind. We need to get behind these women and these men because they realize that they have to establish innocent commissions. They realize that the biggest fraud in criminal justice was eyewitness identification. They realize of the over 330 people exonerated because of the Innocence Project, the overwhelming majority of those were by bogus eyewitness identifications. They realize in the 70s and 80s and early 90s we were plagued by junk science. They realize that for the most part, right, fingerprint evidence was a little bit bogus and hair fiber was ridiculous and footprints and teeth marks, all that was junk science. We need prosecutors that have come to terms, okay, with the fact that these are realities and we need to not only look at innocent folks that could be in jail, but make sure that we don't go a wrong route in future prosecutions and realize that, that we have this overwhelming problem where 33 percent 
of black men in America have some type of felony record as opposed to the 8% of the United States population that does, 33%. And then when you factor in the number of people of color that can't, elect, can't vote, the greatest right we have as citizens because of these, these convictions, it is the, these prosecutors that have come to terms with this that we need to stand behind. Do you get the sense the prosecutors generally care about coming to terms with this? I mean, particularly in places like the South, where as you describe it, hip hop culture still has so much baggage around it, and prosecutors have really no impediment to just dropping the hammer on somebody in a moment of peak. Do you get the sense that prosecutors want to be part of this reform? I think some do. Um, I think some realize it's, uh, it, it is the future. Um, uh, we are uh, we're very divided right now. Uh, I, I, because I try cases, I, I pick juries, and you, one of the greatest um, experiences as a lawyer um, that tries cases is picking juries because most people never get their 15 minutes, except if you're a juror in a big case and someone like me gets to question you for 20, 25 minutes, and you realize when you question jurors, man, people are just, their, their heels are dug in right now. And, but there are, I think, an increasing number of women and men that are running for office at prosecutors that are realizing they need to be open-minded and they need to, you know, they, they need to acknowledge the, the implicit bias that's out there um, and the explicit bias, but they need, to, they, they need to come through those and have come to the terms of those realities. All right, a few more questions before our time's up. Yes, sir. Um, Alex Sanchez, Glenwood Springs. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that most cases don't actually go to court with uh, most people entering pleas. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. And also, uh, in your time defending uh, rappers, what is oftentimes the most biased uh, law you see applied to them? Is it a low-level low level drug offense, or is it some misdemeanor crime? Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, sure. So, um, so one of the, I'm, I'm really glad, you, you just threw me a softball, man. Um, uh, you know, usually you hear between 93 and 97% of cases result in pleas. And the reason that happens is be, for the most part, not because everybody's guilty. That's what people used to say. Well, that's just because everybody's guilty. No, there's a reason why people, you know, the state of North Carolina has the first state paid uh, innocence commission now. We've come to the terms with the fact there are not tens, there are not hundreds. We, are, we have thousands of innocent folks serving jail times right now, a lot of whom just took a plea because they were scared. And so there's a concept known as the trial penalty. And so what the trial penalty is, is the trial penalty is, and this is very important that we combat this, where prosecutors and even judges participate by saying, yeah, we'll give you probation, but if you go to trial and found guilty, you'll be going to jail for a long time. So people say, well, you know, bump that. I'm just gonna enter a plea. And I'm gonna enter a plea, and when I enter that plea, I'm not gonna be able to vote for the rest of my life. I can't get public housing for the rest of my life. I can't get a school loan for the rest of my life. I'm foreclosed out of most jobs for the rest of my life. And so that trial penalty is what forces most people to enter a plea. As far as people in the hip hop industry, um, one of the things that generally you'll see is somebody will be in a, in a Mercedes Sprinter van and one person has a gun and somebody that's a hip hop star has a conviction from when they were 18 years old and they'll charge them, even though they're four rows away, with possession of firearm by convicted felon. That's a problem. And the other is low-level low level drug offenses. Marijuana is always a, a, a case. And even though there are people like my mother out there that say, well, as long as there's states in the country that legalize it, I can never come back guilty, because that's reasonable doubt to me. Unfortunately, I don't get jurors full of my mother, um, <laughs> um, who still thinks Barry Sheck is a better lawyer than me. And we, <laughs> And that just pisses me off. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, uh, you know, it's the low-level drug cases that are, are problematic. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Luke Van Arsdale. I'm a ski bum. Um, so, so, so many of the worst problems you hear about are these institutional issues of racism, over-incarceration, uh, collateral consequences. And those mostly arise out of exercises of discretion by uh, establishment figures like judges and prosecutors. So many of the good or correct outcomes you hear about are, arise from correct exercises of discretion by these establishment 
figures like judges and prosecutors. How can, uh, to bring this back on topic, how can hip hop artists, which for uh, are, are often very iconoclastic and anti-establishment or counter-establishment at the very least, uh, how can they help counteract those establishment tendencies to and and help to incentivize these correct exercises of discretion? So I'll break it up into two parts. Um, first, I'm going to disagree with, with you, uh, and that is that these collateral consequences are not discretionary. They're institutionalized. Um, and so the, the losing the ability to, to vote, losing the ability to possess a firearm, losing the ability to get a student loan and get public housing um, and get a good job and having to check the box that you're convicted are institutionalized problems. Um, so I am going to um, take the opportunity to plug for a second in Atlanta, August 23rd, 24th and 25th, um, my organization is doing a program on collateral consequences and prisoner reentry. Um, our honorary chair is the actor Mike Epps, who, if you know, served three and a half years at a very early age and now is one of the most sought after comedians and actors in Hollywood. Um, we're honoring the governor. We're honoring the former uh, attorney general, interim attorney general of the United States, Sally Yates. Um, we have Scott Budnick, who gives more to prisoner reentry than anybody in America there. We've littered with, not littered, we are just all these great people. And then that Saturday, we are, we are invited and spending our third day at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Thursday night, in honor of Gucci, Alamo Records, a division of Universal, is throwing a party for everybody that attends for almost next to nothing to come um, at the Civil and Human Rights Museum. So look it up. Talk to me. I'll get you there. The second part of your question is, what can they do? It's what I said earlier. It's what I said earlier. Um, I don't know how many of these folks are counterculture, to be honest with you. Some are. Um, but a lot are, you know, by buying 10 cars and buying 32 watches and buying uh, a lot of mansions, I don't think they're so counterculture. Um, uh, I, I think that they're tired, tired of being bad and ready to be bougie. I had to say that. <laughs> um, and, and, and so I think that they have the responsibility that I said to our friend from Houston earlier um, to be speaking up. And that is my criticism of the industry. I think we got time for one last question, and then I'm going to wrap us up. Yes, sir. Hi, Corey Stewart from Washington, D.C. I was wondering if you could comment on the recent loss of XXX Tentacion on your clients and on the culture. So uh, all, all I can tell you uh, about that, uh, because this is how naive I am, when it happened, I never heard of the guy in my life. Um, and then my, like, my account is like blown up over it, my Instagram account, uh, with questions about it. And so here's what I know. Um, I know that um, one really great performer that I know, good kid, uh, was going to go to the funeral and made a decision to stay home, literally, with his mom um, back in his hometown because he was like, you know what? This stuff's crazy out there. I don't know what to say. You know, there's a lot of crazy incidents. And, uh, you know, the way the whole billion dollar lawyer thing started is when young Dolph got shot in, in um, LA, he flew me out there just to talk. I mean, he didn't do anything wrong, and, but just he needed somebody to talk to. And I spent two days talking to him, and then we walked out. He dropped an album and pointed to me and said, I got my billion dollar lawyer with me. And I never heard of that expression in my life, but it's been kind of a cool ride. Um, <laughs> so, um, y you know, I, I, it happens, and I can't even explain. The one thing I can tell you, there's a lot of money in that industry and a lot of jealousy, a lot of crazy De Niro, man, big time. And there's a lot of jealousy out there. That's the only thing I can think of from where I sit. You know, I think we do have time. Let's squeeze in your question before we have to go. Go ahead, sir. Um, I'm Mark Rice. I'm from Down the Road Basalt. Um, you talked about the Sixth Amendment, denial of voting rights for people and things like that. But one thing that you know people sort of tiptoe around is um, law enforcement. Now, we don't want to affect law enforcement, negatively paint them. but. I'm the old white guy, and I remember my first hip hop album was really, pardon my language, F the police. That's where it started. And so what's going on with that? Are, is hip hop afraid to address that anymore, or is it just we're just not talking about it right now? Well, I, I, think, there, I think there are uh, a, a lot of folks um, that are addressing the issue. Um, I think the, the bigger issue. Um, and that has really been a, a cause for me is um, 
and, and that I've tried to talk to folks about is with, with due respect to what happened in Ferguson, which effectively is St. Louis, um, what, what happened with Freddie Gray in Baltimore, which is the home of, of my friend Billy Murphy, you probably know Billy, I mean, and Staten Island in New York City, you know, there are these horrible incidents where, where black men are shot b by police. Um, but these are big cities, and there are a lot of systems of checks and balances, and they're horrible circumstances. I think our bigger problem is in rural America, particularly the rural South, um, where um, I have now taken, instead of a religious mission, I have done two consecutive missions um, with my friend Rick Jones, who's spoken to this program before, the executive director of uh, Neighborhood Defender Service in Harlem. We have gone through rural Mississippi and rural Alabama, um, meeting with folks in the community, particularly uh, public defense providers, and to a person, Rick will always say, my friend Drew says that what we saw in Ferguson and Staten Island and in Baltimore happens every day in rural America, particularly in the South. And to a person, everybody said, yeah, it kind of bothers us when we see these riots because this stuff is going down here all the time and nobody cares. There's no MSNBC, there's no CNN, okay? There's none of them that are sending cameras down that are doing those stories. To me, that's where the epidemic lies, and I hearken back to what I went through with Migos in South Georgia. But I'd like to see people in the industry make it part of, of what they do, because they have such power. And the power really lies in the youth of this country, and they have empowered themselves through social media. They can affect policy, they can affect elections like never before. And I, that's why I reflect back on Meek Mill. Social media is a way to engage people like nothing our civilization has ever seen. But it's just, on, it's really at this point, the ball is in the court of the youth of this country. He is the principal of the Findling Law Firm in Atlanta and the president-elect of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Ladies and gentlemen, Drew Findling. Thanks for talking Thanks, to us. Gotcha. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.